like to, 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 to welcome Dr. Celine Marie Pascal to this, to this webinar series and uh, let you know that uh, she will be presenting for about 40 minutes. While she is presenting, you may feel free to write down your questions uh, using the question section in the GoToWebinar control panel. Uh, you can practice now, just write down hello and I will be able to read that. And at the end of her presentation, uh, we will proceed to read those questions out loud and she will answer them. Uh, now, I would like to uh, ask my colleague Yvette Matwat from IIQM to say a few words to introduce Dr. Celine Marie Pascal. Go ahead, Yvette. Thank you very much, Ricardo. Celine Ray Pascal is one of the leading scholars in the field of language and society. As a sociologist, she explores the reproduction of culture, knowledge, and power through analysis of language and representation. Professor Pascal has published two award-winning books, Making Sense of Race, Gender, and Class, Common Sense, Power, and Privilege in the United States, received the 2008 Distinguished Contribution to Scholarship Book Award from the American Sociological Association section on Race, Gender, and Class and Cartologies of Knowledge, Exploring Qualitative Inquiry received the 2012 Distinguished Book Award from the International Congress of Qualitative Inquiry. She is an editor, she is the editor of a third book, Social Inequity and the Politics of Representation, a Global Landscape, which has been regarded as a field-defining collection of international scholarship. Professor Pascal has published over two dozen professional articles on issues of inequity, qualitative methodology, and media coverage of the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear disaster. Dr. Pascal, we're very glad to have you here with us here today. Thank you very much, Yvette. Uh, I will now give you the control of the session, uh, Celine Marie, so you will uh, be able to show your presentation. Thank you very much, Ricardo and Yvette. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yes, we can hear you very well. Just go ahead. Thank you. Um, and I wanted to say thank you to everyone for joining the webinar. I enjoy this work enormously and I'm happy for the opportunity to share it. Since we're not going to be able to um, have questions as we go, I will look forward to hearing from everyone at the end of the presentation. The webinar explores how social sciences approach qualitative textual analysis. I'll offer a general introduction so that we have a shared understanding of terms and parameters. Then I'll use concrete examples from several studies that I've done to demonstrate specific techniques. The webinar is organized to present different skills in each of three case studies. The first case study will take up what it means to analyze interviews and media as text. The second will, will cover discourse analysis and in the third will combine textual analysis and discourse analysis. My goal is that by the end of this webinar, everyone will have achieved four learning outcomes to support their scholarship. You will have an understanding of social science parameters for textual analyses and their impact, learn how to examine interview transcripts and media accounts as text, develop a critical awareness of how to anchor textual analyses to broader structures of public discourse, and how to move from analysis to presentation of findings for an academic audience. There are many forms of textual analysis and discourse analysis. Each proceeds from different epistemic commitments. As a quick refresher, epistemology regards the origin, nature, and production of knowledge. It's the foundation of theory, method, methodology, and methods. It asks, what can be known and on what terms can we know it? Textual analysis and discourse analysis use interpretive epistemologies, which are anchored to the belief that meaning is socially constructed. While many scholars might agree that this state with the statement generally, there are significant differences among scholars regarding the details, and we'll take this up shortly. Any empirical form interviews, images, media, music, can be analyzed as a text. Textual analysis is distinguished from all other forms of qualitative analysis by the desire to look at rather than through the text itself. To examine interview transcripts or news articles as text 
is to analyze them as constructed accounts that make some things more or less meaningful and more or less visible. By contrast, a more customary treatment of qualitative data looks through the text to the content, which is then treated as a form of evidence in itself. These are some styles of textual analysis, and they have very different epistemic commitments, yet each of these frameworks is concerned with the logic and process of meaning making. Discourse analysis and textual analysis span multiple disciplines across social sciences and humanities. As you can see here, the word discourse has multiple meanings, each of which proceeds from a particular epistemic position that shapes and constrains the analyses. Let's look at two examples. Ethnomethodology is a form of textual analysis that relies on an understanding of discourse as language in use. Typically, this refers to naturally occurring conversation, as opposed to interviews or media. Analysts focus on the co-production of meaning in specific interactions. They're concerned with the ordinary assumptions that underpin the interaction. By contrast, in post-structural analysis, Discourse is understood as a system of representation that produces objects of knowledge. Discourse analysis is not anchored to a text, but to what Judith Butler calls the domains of the sayable. An individual can choose what to say or to write, but broader systems of discourse determine the possibilities of what can be said. Discursive formations are always cultural, not individual. In these two examples, you can see how epistemic commitments inform two styles of discourse analysis. In the social sciences, all research faces two overarching tasks, formalization and interpretation. Formalization refers to the processes used to systematize knowledge production. So it regards standards of inquiry, the nature of evidence, the process of data collection all of which enable research to be recognized as social science by other scholars. In social science, standards for the formalization of qualitative research are limited to analytic induction, grounded theory, or some combination or variation of these. Interpretation refers to the theory or paradigms used to explain the significance of the patterns and their variations. Here, social science researchers find a wider array of theories, paradigms, and logics that can be used to make sense of their findings. While textual and discourse analysis might be understood as methods used to methods in many disciplines, in social science, they're treated as interpretive strategies. The process of formalization and interpretation must work in tandem for scholarship to have traction as a social science. This is key. The webinar focuses on processes of interpretation and how they can work in tandem with processes of formalization. For some scholars, the concept of social construction is used primarily to distinguish between objectively existent and socially produced attributes or characteristics. Even so, there's some flexibility here. The embodiment of hunger can be understood as socially constructed and will vary on how the person experiencing hunger makes sense of it. Consider the experience of hunger for a person with anorexia, for someone on his way to a fashionably late dinner, and for someone searching through a dumpster for food. That experience of hunger will be quite different. To say that something is socially constructed doesn't necessarily produce a shared understanding. At the end of one spectrum, some believe that there is an objective social world to which we assign meaning. This is often what people mean when they say gender is socially constructed. They make a distinction between biologically determined and socially constructed attributes. At the other end of the spectrum are those who believe that everything is socially constructed, even so-called biological attributes, 
would be understood as cultural productions. You want your theoretical framework to make clear what you mean by socially constructed. In my own work, I'm particularly interested in enduring inequalities. Consequently, I create a productive complementarity between processes of formalization and interpretation in order to ground my research to empirical findings and also get at deeper understandings of culture, knowledge, and power. I work from the premise that to understand relations of power, I need to understand how statements are connected to broader cultural discourses. In my work, I've used ethnomethodology and post-structural discourse analysis as my modes of interpretation and um, analytic induction as the process of formalization. All qualitative textual analysis begins with questions of how something is made meaningful in particular ways at particular times for particular audiences. Two big questions that help us to understand the text in relationship to broader cultural discourses are what knowledge must be assumed for particular formations to be ordinary and unproblematic, and what are the potential consequences of this broadly accepted knowledge. The first of these two questions generates an analysis of tacit knowledge that is so broadly shared that it doesn't need to be articulated to be understood. As a consequence, this question enables me to get underneath the text to the cultural discourses that support it. The second of these questions regards the potential implications of such practices for social relations of power. I'm going to use three case studies. Two examine media and one examines interview transcripts to illustrate a range of skills, techniques, and practices for textual and discourse analysis. In the States, there was a dramatic increase in the numbers of people who could not afford housing in the 1980s. More people live without housing in India, but there are no homeless people in India. How is the discursive formation of homelessness established in the U.S., and how does it function? I focused on urban areas and selected prominent papers that were likely to be quoted or reproduced by other news media. Technology is always in a consideration and it shapes our data collection. In this case, I worked with microfiche and CDs. This meant that I needed newspapers that were indexed in the same way so that my search would work across all papers. I wrote a Boolean loop that eliminated all articles that referred to countries other than the United States and to homelessness that resulted from natural disasters so that I could focus on the inability to afford housing that was caused by chronic poverty. Even so, a 15-year time span produced so many articles that I needed to develop a random selection of cases to reduce the study to something manageable. 413 stories. My analysis regarded patterns and variations that ran across all of these articles. My goal was to identify discourses that made visible poverty meaningful to readership, presumably readership that it could, for, could afford housing. Studying news articles doesn't mean that one is doing a textual analysis. Recall that textual analyses look at how meaning is constructed. Historically, scholars in the social sciences have focused on questions in the first column when analyzing texts. Empirical analyses demand that we can point to something as evidence. A lot of excellent work has been produced with this focus. My own research interests are a little bit different. I think of absence as an active production. Consequently, abs absence and assumptions are always part of my inquiry. Again, the analysis of absence is linked to the text. It isn't a matter of speculation. If I think about absence as productive, not accidental, 
I develop a set of questions about the effects of these exclusions on the construction of knowledge. If I want to know for whom a particular text was created, I look at the assumptions that underpin it and imagine categories of readership that might share those assumptions as being unproblematic. I also consider for whom those assumptions might be problematic. While these two lists are not exhaustive, the same kinds of lists would apply to interviews as well as to media. There are many important shifts in the construction of poverty as news. Over 15 years, newly impoverished people were consistently characterized as a better class of poor person and deserving of help. While all newspapers purport to follow professional guidelines, articles about people without housing deviated from these standards without apparent criticism. For example, although the first-hand although first-hand accounts are the cornerstone of reporting, shortly after 1982, reporters stopped including accounts of homelessness from people who were actually homeless. They quoted people with housing almost exclusively regarding the impact of homelessness on their lives. Standards of evidence were held in abeyance for public officials who proclaimed unsubstantiated facts such as the homeless population as being composed of one-third substance abusers, one-third persons with mental illness, and one-third deserving folks who were down on their luck. Consequently, news articles constructed the problem of homelessness as being about the particular kinds of people rather than as being about a particular kind of economy. So at this point I'm going to shift to a textual analysis of interviews. In this project I wanted to understand cultural assumptions about race. If we can argue about our beliefs, our assumptions seldom make it to conscious thought. Consequently, it seemed to me that our common sense assumptions might provide a cognitive stability to systems of race and racism despite changing beliefs. This article is the most theoretical of the three case studies in the webinar. The article conforms to the process of formalization. However, given the emphasis on post-structural discourse analysis, post-positive scholars would likely argue that my claims have exceeded my data. Post-structuralists would likely bristle at the empiricism. If our research is to take us to a future that's different from the past, we have to recognize that research methods are constructed in a particular historical moment and allow ourselves to push established boundaries. The ability of researchers to critique race cannot be separated from the tools that we use to examine it. In order for shifts in research to happen, we need journals and editors who are willing to take that step as well. I'm very grateful to the small journals willing to take big risks in research. I wanted to examine common sense knowledge about race that was broadly shared across categories of social difference in the U.S. Consequently, I used purposive or theoretical sampling for this study to achieve as much diversity as possible. I tape recorded and transcribed the interviews. This produced 1,600 pages of transcript, and I did a textual analysis then of those transcripts. Common sense is a saturation of cultural knowledge that we cannot fail to recognize and which, through its very obviousness, passes without notice. Ideological hegemony operates at the level of common sense in the assumptions that we make about life and the things that we accept as natural. It leads people to believe that we simply see what there is to be seen. For example, common sense leads us to believe that we simply see different races. Common sense knowledge is one way to get at the link between the production of meaning in a localized context and the reproduction of cultural knowledge. Using analytic induction, I collected and coded interviews regarding how people described race. I used the interpretive processes of ethnomethodology and post-structural discourse analysis. 
In standard quali qualitative analyses, I would have to consider what was said as being either true or false. I would try to understand why people might believe things that are not true. Here you can think of Marx's notion of false consciousness. What I especially value about textual analysis is that I never assume to know more or better than my interviewees. Instead, I analyze their meaning-making practices. For example, when people talk about race as physically visible color, the notion of color relied on taken-for-granted knowledge that initially appeared to be full of contradictions. For example, Zach Morrow, who identified himself as Filipino, described race this way. Well, when I see race, it's like I see colors. Black. It goes from white to nationality, Spanish, European categories, like that. And then this way, African, and here he stopped. Beneath the surface of his talk, a common sense understanding of race enabled Zach to place color, nationality, and entire continents on a continuum, as if they were different degrees of the same thing. Across interviews, the logic of race as visible differences in skin color did not rely on color per se. Not all differences or similarities in color were racialized differences. This is possible because, like all racial markers, color is not the property of bodies. That is, white people do not have white skin any more than black people have black skin. Whiteness is structural, not personal. Common sense naturalizes complex historical relations of power by making racialized differences appear to be self-evident, a matter that requires no thought, even if the meanings of race continue to slide in ways that are fraught with contradictions and devastating in their impact. Analyzing common sense knowledge is a technique in ethnomethodology that enables us to get under the text and look at what was not said. Shared culture allows us to rely on tacit forms of knowledge. It's impossible to say everything that we want to say in a given moment. It would be very tedious if we were that specific. And it's in those gaps between what we say and what we assume that this particular style of analysis offers us a lot of analytic power. While an examination of tacit knowledge enabled me to get under the text, post-structural discourse analysis allowed me to leave the text, to consider difference as a strategic and positional, a strategic and positional, and to identify identity as mobile and performative. The complementary interpretive strategies when tied to analytic induction as the process of formalization enabled me to demonstrate the findings summarized on this slide. Discourses are not imaginary relations. They inscribe and are inscribed by the materiality of social, institutional, and cultural practices. The function of discourse is to constitute subjects as the bearers of social structures and the apparently self-evident of nature of race reinscribes both a history and a vision of power. These are not findings that one would ordinarily come to in an empirical analysis. So it's the combination of ethnomethodology, post-structural discourse analysis, and analytic induction that enables me to actually demonstrate these three bullet points. Now let's look at the last case study, which combines textual and discourse analysis in a different way. In designing a study of the media coverage of the meltdown of the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant, I began by asking a very simple question. How did media construct the presence and meaning of risk? This very broad and basic research question served as a starting point that I refined through processes of analysis and coding. However, the immediate next step was to identify the most effective media to study. 
In the humanities, some forms of discourse analysis are based on a single newspaper article or a single interview. In the social sciences, the process of formalization requires that we either collect all available data or work until we reach saturation. I collected all available data for four media outlets between March 11, 2000, March 11, 2011 when the disaster occurred and March 11, 2013 when I began my data analysis. This produced a corpus of 2,144 articles, which gave me both a new problem and a new opportunity. I entered the Fukushima media study believing that computer software reduced qualitative analyses to quantitative strategies. Although computer programs might identify all instances and variations of the word risk correctly, it's possible that the concept of risk was raised in those news articles without actually using that specific word. I wasn't convinced that any computer software could be useful for interpretive scholarship, but I had also backed myself into a corner. I could do a random sample of the accounts, but I worried about the details that I might miss. I decided to take a considered chance and used in vivo. In the end, I was able to make use of a very competent search engine, but not reduce my analysis to a quantitative strategy. My initial read of the corpus of articles produced 30 open codes. These included the words that you see here, risk, risky, danger. I tried to imagine all of the different ways in which risk, words that might be associated with risk. This gave me 23 first-level codes for risk when we ran it through in vivo. Those are listed here to the right on the screen. Well, let me go back one moment. So these first-level codes, um, you can see I had a lot of options, and of these, I chose risk to people. All right, so then I went on. My first level code, the open level coding is, uh, the first level is risk, and the second level code is risk to health. The third level code was low radiation risk. On the screen, what you see is an excerpt from one of my coding sheets, and I'll give you time to read it in a moment. But first, I want to say that detailed analysis of raw data always requires some form of organizational structure. In this case, I began by opening a Word document entitled Low Risk. On this page, I included all references to low risk. The collection enabled me to focus sharply on commonalities and differences across the data. For context, it's important to include a line of text above and below whatever it was that caught your eye. On my original, I also included links to the full article so that I could easily go back and forth to understand the larger article in which the account was constructed. And after reading the articles, I would then return again to the collection of excerpts and begin to work on interpreting patterns and variations across the data within this code. As a side note, I find it very helpful in the writing process to include formal citations at this stage. It's just a personal preference. So let's take a minute now and read through the excerpt. When moving from identifying exemplars, um, when moving from identifying exemplars to using them in the writing, you'll want to keep the context of at least a line above and a line below. So when you look at this text here, the line that I'm most interested in begins, and natural radiation from rocks. So let's take a moment here. Okay, so we want to provide, when writing, we want to provide sufficient context for the readers. As scholars, 
we make our best effort to make our logic transparent at each step, allowing readers to agree and disagree as they read. Even if a critical reader is persuaded by my analysis of a particular exemplar, especially one um, with such an outrageous claim, the reader might feel that that's unrepresentative of the media coverage in general that's being studied. So consequently, it's important to include some varied number of exemplars for every pattern. The exact number will be based on the type of data and the kinds of patterns that you're finding. I followed this particular exemplar with additional ones that demonstrated a range of strategies deployed to produce the understanding of low risk. Here is the excerpt that we just reviewed being used as an exemplar. The excerpt was cut short of the ideal of one line above and one line below to adjust for the word count limitations of the journal. Notice that the analysis stays very close to the text and lays out my logic for the reader to evaluate. Let's take a moment and read it. Okay. Um, I understand this will be posted online later, so if you're having trouble getting uh, caught up with the reading, you'll be able to find it and go back to it later. All right, so in building your article, you want to look at each section as a coherent whole and develop an overarching analysis of patterns and variations. Then you situate your work within existing literature. How does your work affirm, challenge, extend, or complicate what we already know. Often things that seem obvious to us because of our relationship with the data may not be obvious to others. So listening to our critics is a really important component of refining our analyses. Sometimes there are gaps in our logic that need to be filled in more, co more coherently. Learning how to make the most effective use of criticism without allowing it to derail our original scholarship is one of the most important tools a scholar can have. When we accept the socially constructed nature of meaning, it becomes easier to see criticism as pointing to ways that we need to more effectively translate our insights for others. So at the end of each section on which you've looked at the uh, patterns, the variations, then you've added, you write a concluding section in which you situate your analysis within the current literature. After building a strong analytical base, I was able to write a summary analysis for this particular pattern that includes the existing literature. This is an excerpt from that concluding section. As you read this, notice that my analysis includes what was said and what was left out. These reporting practices passed as unremarkable. They were ordinary across all four outlets in news about the largest nuclear disaster to date. Let's take a moment and read it. All right, so as we move on, we want to think about every section as having a summary that integrates the pattern, the variations of the pattern, and the literature. This next slide is going to look at the components of the discussion, the final discussion section of the paper. So we want a systematic analysis 
throughout the paper that's going to continually build. We're looking at the patterns and the variations. Every pattern has its own section. Every section has its own summary. And then the discussion draws from your summaries and moves the analysis off the page. In the discussion section of your paper, you're going to bring the analyses together from the reader. This is the so what of the paper. We move from the empirical evidence of something very localized to cultural implications. It becomes an analysis of collective practices, in this case of the mainstream media, and links together all of the themes and variations into something coherent and considers the long-term implications of the collective practices. Here is an excerpt from the discussion section of this article. Let's take a moment to read it. The article began by establishing the reporting practices and their specific consequences. The final analysis lifts off the page entirely and undertakes a broader and more conceptual or theoretical framing of the importance and implications of the study. If the reader has been persuaded by the logic of the analyses thus far, the final section will have deep resonance. Again, notice that the potential consequences are analyzed without making statements about intentionality. In some ways, the processes of formalization and interpretation that have been naturalized as common sense in the social sciences can make it hard to understand how they work, separately or in tandem. Your epistemic commitments will profoundly shape your scholarship make these a conscious choice. What's obvious to you will not be obvious to others. Help them to understand what it is that you're seeing. Research is too powerful to be bound to methods developed more than a century ago. They can and should be approved upon. As we move into an open conversation, I want to acknowledge some of the people who made this presentation possible. Melissa Freeman, a professor in the Qualitative Research Program at the University of Georgia, extended an invitation that made it possible for me to be here. Joy Adams, a human geographer and instructional, and instructional designer from American University, was the genius behind much of the presentation that you're actually looking at on the screen. Yvette McWatt, the event and program coordinator at the International Institute for Qualitative Methodology, help to make the wheels on the bus go round. And of course, we have wizards behind the screen at Atlas. Many thanks to everyone who helped to make this presentation possible. I look forward to hearing the insights and questions from the audience. Um, on this screen, you'll find uh, my website and my email address. Please uh, drop me a line. Thank you very much. Let's now uh, see what questions we have, and I would like to offer the microphone to Amy, Amy Beckett. Let me, let me see if you have a working microphone. Your microphone is now open. Go ahead. Amy? Well, it could be that she doesn't have a working microphone, so let me read her question out loud. Uh, she's asking, she's saying the following, 
uh, when you talk about concluding each section, uh, how are you defining section? Ah, thank you for that question, Amy. Um, sorry, we just had someone pop in unexpectedly. Um, That's okay. Thank you very much for that question. The sections are divided, um, in my mind, I organize the paper by the pattern that I'm trying to explain. Right? And the pattern always has attendant variation. So I speak as if there's a pattern, but the pattern and attendant variations form a section. So you want the paper and the analysis to be as systematic as possible. Uh, so however many patterns that you're going to be examining in a journal article, it's hard to get more than two or three. Um, in a book, of course, you have a, a much broader range. Uh, those would determine the sections of the article or the presentation. And Amy is following by saying, uh, do you use headers for them? Yes, absolutely. So um, you would use headers, I think of them as kind of drawers, right, that mark off uh, where you're putting your ideas. Okay, thank you. I will, I will try to, um, and Amy responded, excellent. So just for you to know. Uh, let me try to give the microphone to Jose Isaac. Uh, I will unmute you. Jose, go ahead. Thank you, Professor, for your presentation. Uh, I have, um, OK, I, I am doing my first qualitative research using interviews. I have uh, maybe a technical question about reliability. Uh, my question is, should I, should I test reliability after analyzing just a small part of my data, uh, which usually we do this to build a coding system, or after analyzing all the data? Thank you. Well, thank, thank you very Jose. much for your question, Jose. Um, you're asking about when you take up concerns of reliability, is that right? Yes, exactly. In which moment we should uh, test the real reliability, you know? Just when we build the coding system, when we analyze just uh, a small part of our data, or when we finish to analyze all the data. I think of reliability as a term that comes more from quantitative work um, because you, you're, it's a different framework. What, what we want in qualitative work is to know that we have explained 100% of our data and its variations. So it's not so much, that it's reliable in that you're, you're not using abstracted data, right? You have the interview, you have the text, but you want to be confident that what you're really analyzing is uh, all of what's there. So it's a process of making oneself aware of being accountable to other possibilities, perhaps the coding. You could try coding it in a couple of different ways. We can code so narrowly that all of our data looks idiosyncratic, or we can code so broadly that it seems uh, almost nonsensical, right? It's just, it's too, it's not specific enough to be able to say anything about. So we have to kind of work a different, uh, at a different pace with our coding to make sure that we are really getting at an explanation of the variation. Does that answer the question for you? Yes, yes, okay, thank you. Thank you, Jose. I will now uh, offer the microphone to Kathy. Kathy, and also could you just start by uh, uh, saying where you are from? And I will unmute you now, Kathy. Go ahead. Hi, I am from American University as well. Okay. Uh, my question is, uh, Dr. Pascal, you mentioned that you continue with your data collection until you reach saturation. And I'm wondering how you identify the saturation point, both qualitatively and quantitatively. Um, thanks, Kathy. Um, and uh, shout out to a colleague at American University. Um, in, in qualitative work, uh, I would not, saturation doesn't have a quantitative component to it. 
So when we collect data, we look for a saturation means that no new observable patterns, theories, points of view are being collected. So when we reach a place where we're hearing the same thing over and over again, we have reached saturation. This might take a hundred interviews if you have a very diverse population. It could take fewer interviews if you have a very homogeneous population. And this was what was so surprising in my data collection about common sense about race. I didn't expect to reach saturation after only 23 interviews, but there was a, such very strong cultural understanding of what constitutes race that um, that in itself was part of the findings. Did I answer your question okay? Yes, thank you very much. Thank okay, you. Thank you. <clears throat> there is another question about saturation, and I want to ask Anna if what uh, was already said is is enough, or would you like to add anything, Anna? Uh, almost. I'm just curious how we explain um, how we achieved saturation in a writing um, in a kind of acceptable way, because. Um, I'm just thinking, I'm from Alberta, University of Alberta, uh, and I'm in political science and I struggle with journals that don't take qualitative research seriously because you can't prove, you can't uh, show something. So how do we show that we achieved saturation? Um, thank you. Thank you very much for your question. I think that the um, You've raised an important topic, and the, um, the challenges to qualitative research, um, gosh, there are a lot of them, and I think it's a matter in some times, um, not even of trying to persuade journals that the work is of value, but of publishing in journals that know the work is of value and enable you to really flourish, rather than trying to um, convince people that tires are around, if that makes sense. So um, in terms of saturation, there are many excellent books on qualitative research that will talk about um, different techniques for reaching saturation. In articles, I have always found it to be enough to say I interviewed until I reached saturation. And these are the numbers of interviews, and um, this is what I expected or not what I expected. But I don't justify beyond that because it's simply a small part of my method section. It's not really a significant part of the article itself. Helpful? Okay, it looks like um, it might be okay for, with that. So let me now ask uh, Miali. I will try to give you the microphone, Miali. Uh, just a second. Go ahead. Hello, um, thank you very much for the presentation. I'm Yali, I'm at the University of Lausanne in Switzerland. I'm originally from Madagascar, actually. I do my research on fisheries. Uh, I would like to ask, um, when you used the software, did you use it beyond finding patterns, like some kinds of uh, analysis options in the software, for example? Hi, Miali. Thank you for joining us. Um, no, I have to say that I'm a bit of a cretin when it comes to the software. I had a doctoral student who was uh, who trained in how to use in vivo as we worked, and we used it really uh, in a search for uh, identifying these patterns, uh, and then I did the rest of the work by hand. Oh, okay. Okay. Thank yeah, you. I have I have no doubt that I radically underutilized the capacity of NVivo, and I'm still, I have to say, the jury is. Hello? The usefulness of software. Is it something that you use? I, I missed your question. I, I think there was a bit of a cut. Yes. Could, would you repeat, please? Uh, uh, we, we, we missed part of what you said. Absolutely. I said that um, for me, I'm still undecided about the usefulness of qualitative research, of, sorry, not qualitative research, of qualitative 
um, mechanized systems of qualitative analysis. And I wanted to know, um, mainly, if you use something like in vivo in your own scholarship. Yeah, I'm using, I'm actually using Atlas. So I've just finished coding of like 200 interviews. And I'm just like at this stage at the moment, but I also have reports and media content. And I'm at this like uh, stage where I need to reconcile the two content. I haven't used um, a software for the media content, just for my interviews. Mm -hmm. Well, I'd be very interested in um, seeing how that goes for you. If you want to drop a line later, I'd, I'd love to hear more. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Miali. And in fact, Miali, let me, um, I, I will be sending you a note uh, privately uh, so that you can communicate with me because I use Atlas TI and I know it well, so I can give you some, some recommendations as well. Okay. Uh, so let me now go to uh, Astrid. And Astrid does not have a, a, a microphone, so she's asking the following. Uh, she wrote, when doing textual analysis of interviews, could you explain a bit more how you go about coding? Do you first, uh, and do you do first and second level coding, uh, both using inductive analysis and bringing up theory in the discussion only? Or do you use an inductive deductive coding strategy? Um, thank you, Astrid. Um, I don't think there's anything that is purely inductive analysis, that all analysis um, threads through induction, deduction, abduction, that it is a, a complicated process and never as linear as it sounds in these presentations. So when I have interview data, I think about um, Again, I'm reading to look at how meaning is being constructed, and I create codes um, that reflect some of the uh, initial observations that strike me as of interest. It might be characterizations, it might be uh, the creation of us and them, it might be um, structural pieces in how they talk. So when I interviewed people about race, uh, every when I asked people if they had a racial identity, um, only some people that I talked to would say, who, me? And there were only two of us in the room. So that was interesting to me. I didn't know how to make sense of it. But by that time I finished my interviews, I realized only white people said that to me. Who, me? And I realized that that became a, a, something that I wanted to pursue in my analysis. So for me, the process of thinking about coding isn't something that happens just when interviews are done, but is I'm always thinking about, OK, how does this make sense? Does it relate to anything else that I've heard? Do I want to follow up on this? So it's a, a very engaged process. OK, okay? thank you. Uh, I will now offer the microphone to Paul. Paul, you can mute your microphone uh, or telephone, in fact. Uh, you can do that yourself and ask the question. And if you cannot, then I will read it out loud. So let's wait for a few seconds to see if he can unmute his. Uh... No, I don't think he can. So let me read this out loud. Uh, can you talk more about the nuclear example and the process used to identify the first level risk, second level, and third levels? For example, is it a function of the number of times the words were mentioned in the media or something else? Thank you. The, um, the um, study on Fukushima was very surprising to me on many levels. Um, I pursued risk not because it was something that was talked about a lot, but because it wasn't talked about very much. It was surprising to me that in the largest and on the large, it's continuing nuclear disaster, we hear nothing about it. And uh, the reporting on it was very limited uh, to particular kinds of um, 
concerns about stock markets and um, business concerns, power, uh, power grids and energy systems, but not risks to the people's health. Um, so that's why I chose that particular one um, and then just drilled down deeper into you know, risk um, not just to the workers but risk to the population, risk to health um, and went that way. Did I answer your question, Paul? Okay, let's wait. Uh, he is communicating by uh, chat. Uh, he hasn't, uh, oh yes, he said thank you. Uh, so let me now uh, ask ask uh, uh, Aliyah. Aliyah, I will try to give you the microphone. And, and my apologies if I'm not pronouncing your name well. Uh, go ahead. Um, hi there. I do qualitative research, and I've just started w working in on qualitative work. And I often get the question, how do you reconcile interviewees who um, might disagree or um, have inconsistencies in the way that they talk about things. How do you deal with that in one theme if there's inconsistencies or different points of view? Um, where are you located? Uh, I'm in Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, Aaliyah. Is it cold up there? It's not bad. It's only <laughs> minus eight. Uh, um, so, your question was, how we would um, deal with inconsistencies. Yeah, and differences of opinion within the same theme. I often get that question, and I'm just not quite sure how to answer it. Well, I think that um, a traditional qualitative analysis of interviews sort of works on a consensus theory of truth. I've interviewed 25 people and 22 of them said X, so we report that X is how people feel or think. And I find that really problematic because if you interview 25 white people in the United States about racism and they told you it didn't exist, it would be problematic to take that as a fact that racism didn't exist. So you see the, the trouble with that consensus theory of truth. In textual analysis, we have so much more freedom and I think quite a lot of integrity of being able to look at a text and actually take it on its own terms. So I once interviewed uh, people about uh, class and I interviewed quite a number of multimillionaires who gave me their income without hesitation, $10 million in assets, you know, really wealthy people. And when I asked them to describe themselves by class, they said, oh, I'm middle class. And then I thought my head would explode. How does someone with that much money think they're middle class? And so I started trying to imagine it from their point and to listen to them carefully, to look at the data very carefully. And it seemed to me that what they were saying, that they made a distinction between being wealthy and being ordinary. And that for most people in our day-to-day -day lives, we think of ourselves as ordinary or being in the middle. So there is a kind of social distinction where one could be an ordinary person and an economic distinction, which they're really happy to say, yes, I have all this money. So being able to look at it from that perspective gave me some other ways to understand what they were saying. Otherwise, I was kind of stuck in you know, false consciousness because they weren't trying to deceive me by their telling me how much they made and by deciding that that was middle class. Does that make sense? Yeah, that does make sense. And I guess like a follow-up question would be, what about the ones who had $10 million in assets but didn't want to be considered ordinary or didn't consider themselves ordinary? Oh, I had only um, really two such people and they were, they really embraced being rich. They were happy that they were rich. They found great um, uh, kind of liberation in it. They were people who had come up from great poverty and understood that being rich meant that when um, this particular person went to the hospital that he would know not just the doctor, but he knew the head of the hospital. and He was sure that they weren't going to leave an instrument in him at the end of the surgery. 
he felt that he and his family would be well cared for because of the wealth. Um, he was a person who had been, at one point his family wasn't allowed to own land in the United States because of the ways that uh, laws worked um, around racism. So he had a deep appreciation of it. Uh, thank you. There's only one more question that I would like to ask you to answer, but very short. If you could give the, the answer in a few words only because we are already on time. Uh, Brittany is asking, what methods have you utilized to address uh, trustworthiness of the data? Um, the trustworthiness of the data, and you want a short answer. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> as much as you can. In qualitative work, the trustworthiness of the data is its capacity to credibly and fully explain 100% of what you're looking at in your data. That's a really high bar. It's much tougher than what I think of in quantitative work. Um, and if you meet that, then um, you have the not just the gold standard, but also the ordinary standard of qualitative research. Thank you very much. And uh, Amy, let me ask you if you could uh, write down your question uh, directly to, to Celine uh, Marie, uh, which is a follow-up question from something you asked earlier. Uh, Amy, I would appreciate that. We have come uh, to the end of this presentation, and I would like to ask uh, my colleague Yvette to say a few words before we say goodbye. Thanks, Ricardo, and thanks very much, Celine Marie. That was a great presentation. Um, this will be our last masterclass webinar for 2017, so thank you all for your support throughout the year. Um, keep an eye on our website, and we'll hopefully have the 2018 um, schedule up soon. Thank you, Yvette. Uh, thank you, all of you, for coming. Uh, we have had this program for already 40 years very successful. We will go into a fifth year uh, uh, in, in, in 2018 and uh, the success of this program depends exclusively on your participation. So please let your, uh, your students and colleagues know about this and maybe you can even include the program in the uh, curriculum, in the teaching curriculum of some classes and um, and uh, again, we all, we all welcome your, your participation. And, and, and also, Celine Marie, thank you for, for uh, uh, giving this presentation today. Would you like to say a few words before we close? I would just offer my gratitude to you and Yvette and the whole team for making this possible. And to the audience, I think it is always a bit challenging in webinars to uh, hang in there. Your questions were great. I'm very happy to uh, hear from you if you send an email in the future about any other aspects of the presentation and to get to know more of the work. Uh, it's impressive to have 300 people engaged in uh, this conversation about textual analysis and the potentials for scholarship. So many thanks to everyone and best wishes. Thank you very much. And let me just finish by asking you, as well as everybody else, uh, if you would like to recommend uh, uh, people uh, for next year's uh, uh, series, uh, please go ahead and, and write to us. Um, you can write to Yvette Mabwat or myself. In fact, what I will do is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write down my, my email address uh, so that all of you will have it. And uh, if you would like to make recommendations for next year, uh, in terms of people, but also in terms of topics, uh, you know, we would highly appreciate that. So thank you, all of you. And my email is being written down now uh, and sent to all of you. And, and Yvette, of course, I will share that with you if I get some, uh, some recommendations from people. So thank That'd you, all of you. Thank you all of you and uh, hopefully we'll see you again next year. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye.